the pound or hash. Good day and welcome to the LexisNexis complimentary webinar, Why Risk Monitoring Matters, the Risk Monitoring Imperative. My name is Liana Drosteva and I'm a marketing manager here at LexisNexis and I will be your host for today's event. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a quick reminder before we get started, today's conference is being recorded. Our speakers will respond to questions at the end of their presentation via the web, and those of you logged on to WebEx are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by clicking on the Q&A button in the upper right corner of your WebEx console or in full screen on the question mark Q&A icon on your floating event control panel. Simply type your questions in the open Q&A panel and click send. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to your speakers. Karen Gray is a 23-year LexisNexis veteran. Karen is a Senior Entity Due Diligence and Monitoring Specialist and serves as a LexisNexis expert and central point person for all due diligence and third-party monitoring solutions. She's a resource for benchmarking, market intelligence, strategic category management, and vendor selection, and focuses on efforts to improve profitability and cash flow, risk mitigation, and operational efficiencies, with regards to vendor selection and monitoring. Nimpavana Berlicotti joined LexisNexis on January 2017 as a global product manager. Prior to LexisNexis, Pavana worked at Jagger, where she has been leading and launching products in procurement and spend management. Prior to Jagger, Pavana has been involved with a variety of product portfolio as product manager for PeopleFluid and IBM. In addition, Pavana brings a wealth of experience in the area of user-centric design and agile development. Pavana is passionate about solving customer pain points and providing thought leadership to supply chain management community. At this time, I'll turn things over to Karen to begin the webinar. Karen? Thank you, Ileana. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We want to thank you again for joining LexisNexis today as we speak to why monitoring matters the risk monitoring imperative. LexisNexis's content and services have been trusted globally by businesses and governments for more than 40 years. And our solutions are aligned to your due diligence and monitoring workflow processes. And we can help you manage a variety of business risks, help you meet your strategic goals, and accomplish greater returns on your investment. You'll notice by our slide here, we are part of the Relix Group. We are located in 175 countries with more than 10,000 employees worldwide. So with that, let's set the tone for why monitoring matters. Thanks to the input from hundreds of compliance leaders from around the world, we have insight as to the perceived strengths and weaknesses of risk programs today. We summoned Kroll, who partnered with Ethisphere, and they launched a survey to a global audience in November of 2016. And they asked a variety of questions about third-party due diligence, stakeholder engagement, and merger and acquisition activity. 388 qualified responses from senior level executives, ranging from ethics, compliance officers, anti-bribery and corruption officials, both from the public and the private sector, in representative of many industries, they help to shape the presentation that we have put together for you today. So consider this, 57% of that 388 responded to their expectations that their organization's risk would persist at the same levels as last year. 35% expected an increased risk over last year, and only 8% expected a decrease in their risk that they will face this year. So in addition to monitoring media for negative news mentions of third parties, companies are recommended to implement ongoing risk-based monitoring, especially companies in highly regulated industries. You may already monitor for compliance risk, but you also need to track regulatory rulemaking um, and that environment to understand how compliance risk can change, either based on new policies or as guidances come to light. If you are currently a subscriber to one of the many LexisNexis solutions, then you know that Nexus.com and Lexis Diligence specifically address regulatory monitoring 
through the alerts feature. Those alerts with some enhancements that we made late last year and early this year, those enhancements provide for those results to be shared with others throughout the organization. There's been a rise in reputational risk. Social compliance is at an all-time high. Social compliance has put pressure on companies from NGOs to consumer groups and consumers to adhere to ethical business practices. And they have required the same adherence from suppliers and third parties. Laws like the UK Modern Slavery Act or the California Transparency in Supply Chains Act both serve to increase that pressure. There is increased visibility in the, quote, always on, unquote, media. Combined with greater awareness about forced labor, workplace safety, eco-sustainability, and more, it means that companies must now address traceability along their supply chains, not only to meet the regulators, but also to meet the public's expectations. Protecting corporate and brand reputation has long been a risk. And so the Harvard Business School, through their Working Knowledge blog, they note that in this, quote, 24-hour information news cycle, the traditional news cycle is long dead and buried. LexisNexis has realized that as well. There is a need for near real-time news updates. The assumption is that information will get out sooner or later, and in most instances, it's likely sooner. I'm going to quote a woman, her name is Lynn Schulman. She's the National Crisis Director for Magnet Communications out of New York. And she admits, quote, you have to think that everything that your company does will reach the outside world, unquote. Corporate leaders are sensitive to that shift. In 2017, the Anti-Bribery and Corruption Benchmarking Report, reputational concerns were paramount. And this report also stated, quote, that reputational concerns move from least likely to most likely as a reason for third parties to fail the vetting standards in just the course of one calendar year. Well, they're right to be concerned because it's not just regulators that are watching. Consumers pay attention as well. And when consumers lose trust, whether it's in your company, your brand, your product, even your services, whether that's due to data breach, a product recall, regulatory or social compliance failures, consumers speak with their wallets. So what are the ongoing challenges to your organization? What do you face today with regard to monitoring your own third parties? Well, organizations today we have found face an evolving array of risks. Corporate boards and executive leaders are too feeling the pressure. According to a global survey of board members and C-suite executives, the impact, quote, of the UK Brexit vote, the increased volatility in commodity markets, the polarization surrounding the, re the recent US presidential election, terrorist events, and asset bubbles in China, China all continued this discussion with regard to um, equality, fair wages, and the economic stability of parts unknown. There is ongoing instability in the Middle East, and all of these have resulted in elevated concerns about business risk in 2017. When you look at the companies that increasingly rely on third parties to conduct business, those third parties could be suppliers, it could be merger and acquisition targets, it could be agents, brokers, the list goes on. You could be a complex, globally distributed uh, company, you could have an extensive supply chain, you could also have a pretty limited or a fair scope with regard to clients, partners, and agents working on your behalf. But look at the statistic at the bottom of our screen. 40% of companies oversee more than 1,000 third parties annually. 29% of companies manage more than 5,000 third party relationships. So we go back to do less, to do less, to do more with less. How are companies achieving this when there is only so much manpower in play, and there's only so much technology investment that has hit the line. So those numbers don't even include the customers. As a result, we see our consumers, our companies, they need a risk mitigation strategy that goes well beyond a traditional due diligence for onboarding suppliers and third parties. Now Kroll comes back into place, and we've got a quote here, 55% 
of the respondents in this report identified that they have legal, ethical, or compliance issues with a third party after the due diligence had been conducted. So we recommend in response to that, an ongoing monitoring program could help you build a more complete picture of risk exposure and proactively mitigate your risk. So what's in store? Well, the landscape of third-party due diligence is definitely evolving. We are trying to mitigate regulatory risk as a top concern, especially given that the evolving regulatory environment, there is a leap in enforcement actions. This graphic shows a depiction of Trace International's GER report of 2016. And what we look at is there's a significant year-over-year -year increase in the number of U.S and non-U.S. enforcement actions with regard to bribery of a, for, of a foreign official. So now we start to look at things like PEPs or sanctions and warnings, and how do we capture that if we don't have a tool to do that as well? Let me put some posture around this U.S. versus non-U.S. In the U.S., the number of enforcement actions were doubled of the previous year. In the non-U.S. jurisdiction, European countries remained really at the forefront of this trend, together accounting for 42% of these open investigations by the FCPA, compared to 46% being conducted in the U.S. The United Kingdom remains the leader within the European market with 29 open investigations. Germany follows suit with 17. So this woman, Alexandra Rage, W-R-A-G-E, she's the president of Trace International. And she is quoted to say that the U.S. has been conducting and concluding enforcement actions at unprecedented rates. And other jurisdictions have been stepping up on their prosecution rates as well. There are new anti-corruption laws that are passed worldwide. Um, we have a really hard time keeping up with those. So even in your monitoring efforts, where we may be monitoring a third party, it's monitoring these anti-corruption laws, bribery infractions, things of that nature that would affect our supply chain, affect our third party uh, motion. We need to be able to monitor those as well. She also goes to say that there are short-term fluctuations and trends, but she does believe that it represents a continued development of a global consistent that transactional or transnational bribery will not be tolerated. So let's talk about the LexisNexis approach to ongoing monitoring. We have defined, uh, defined and coined a term called PESTL. You may be familiar with PESTL. It stands for political, economic, sociocultural, technological, legal, and environmental risk. So when we look at PESTL, we look at political. Think about things like tax policies or trade tariffs or political unrest where you may have a third party in which they're headquartered, or there may be a call center that is um, housed in a governmental um, entity um, in which provides ethical challenges regardless of where you sit. They happen to sit in the hotbed. We look at E for economics. So when we're looking at this kind of risk, we're looking at things like inflation rates, interest rates, anything that regards a foreign exchange rate, economic growth patterns not only microeconomic, but also macroeconomic. So anything that might behoove us to take a peek at with regard to an industry's performance. We also look at things under the economic category that look at restructuring, solvency, M&A, audits, and even forfeiture of business. When we talk about S, sociocultural, you may hear us reference that as social, but sociocultural. We start to monitor trends, whether those are cultural or changes in the population. There might be immigration um, patterns that we want to monitor. There might even be education levels that we want to monitor that affects a, a consumer or a work base, if you will. When we look at societal, we also look at things like product recalls and any sort of child labor violations, employment issues, labor unions, any sort of violences against human uh, human capacity, human capital. We also look at things like health and safety. Um, has an organization been um, safely guarded with regard to their training programs and how they treat their employees, or have they not? When we talk about T, uh, technological, we also parallel that with operational. 
Um, so we think about things like cyber theft, uh, strikes, court closure, inventory management control. We also look at things like demergers or spinoffs or things like hacking. When we start to look at the reliability of, let's say, access to um, their solutions, uh, the vulnerabilities that they have with regard to hacking and cyber threats and so forth, we then rank them in this pestle category of T for technological. Let's round out the end of our PESTLE acronym here with legal and environmental. So legal is going to give us a regulatory landscape. Is there some sort of anti-money laundering or any bribery or corruption motion that's going on that challenges the compliance of your third party in this realm? Are there consumer laws? Are there safety standards that either are being met or not being met? So when we look at the legal category, we're also looking at things like lawsuits or litigation, patent infringement. If you're a pharmaceutical company and there is a patent infringement on one of your either medical devices or one of the pharmaceuticals in the market, that money to fight that lawsuit for patent infringement has to come from somewhere. And it is a large distraction, not just at the marketing and the sales and the design of that, um, of, of that patent, but it's also a capture of the attention of anybody in the upper levels of management. How to defend that? Do we settle out of court? Is there a pattern of this kind of litigation with others that we've partnered with in a third-party environment? So all of that serves as distraction, both um, physically and both economically. The last category to cover here is E for environmental. So think about man-made disasters or natural-made disasters. Think about climate weather, geographic location, uh, global changes in the climate. If there are um, motions, we got a report recently about one of the largest retailers that we all probably have in our local malls. They've been tied to uh, dumping hazardous waste into a, uh, a river stream. So we look at things like that, and when we look at the sustainability of that particular company, um, we don't see that perhaps translate to the goods and services that we buy in their storefront, their brick and mortar. But as we start to look at the impression that that reputational risk then is exposed, we start to look at things like that in addition to water quality, uh, the poison or the pollution of uh, um, water sources for a particular community where so they might uh, import goods and services from. So with that, I'm going to turn over the microphone to my colleague, Pawana Berlicotti. We are going to take an online tour and demonstration of LexisNexis's next generation monitoring solution. It is called LexisNexis Entity Insight. So with that, I'm going to ask that Pawana share her screen, and we will take a tour of the online tool. Thank you, everyone. All right, can someone confirm that you can see my screen? Pawana, we can see it. Perfect, thank you, Tara. All right, so um, Karen talked about the, the high-level definition of PESOL and how do we use PESOL in terms of supply chain. And then I'm going to walk you through our LexisNexis Entity Insight product today and talk about how you're monitoring risk over time based on those uh, six different angles. So I'm just logged into my dashboard. I just logged in, and I see some administrative details on the top. Uh, you, you look at, I usually look at the, the big number first. I just tend to do that. Um, so if you look at 10,000 uh, the subscription plan, what you are buying from this product is that you can upload and monitor up to 10,000 suppliers on an ongoing basis. And you have only uh, used about 376 of them, and you have 9,622 left. Right? So this is a, a beginning. Let's say you are just monitoring your tier one or your, uh, your high-risk uh, suppliers initially. And it also looks at how many feeds I have set up. So this is the news that's been harvested by LexisNexis, and it has been scored based on our PESOL algorithm for high, medium, low risk, and then what type of index term flows into that, and I, I will walk you through that later. Uh, but it just uh, means that you have set up 36 of the feeds that will either feed into your own systems or your emails, your uh, supply chain, your supplier management solution, whatever you, 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 wherever you need to monitor your risk. And this is telling me this is by default set for last 30 months, 30, uh, last month. So 30 days, you're looking at the flow of news that's coming on for each of these special categories. You look at your political, just the color coding, that way you can easily scan. And if you look at it, you see the sudden spike of legal news. It's 2,244 articles for your 300-some entities on May 29th. And then you look at it, that there's um, you know, 
slight decrease on the 14th, and then some, some increase again on the June, right? So you, you might say, what is happening here? I want to see. Why is it producing 2,244 um, news articles? And you could go through that, or you could say, you know what, I want to only look at my particular supplier who I'm really concerned about, and then to see if it's producing news on the legal category or not. Okay, so to that, you just go down to your uh, entity's uh, volume. Again, same, same uh, time frame, last 30 days, but here it's specific to your entity. So you might look at it and say, well, Walmart and, and IBM, they're here, but air gas seems to be producing a lot of news. But Walmart has a lot of over 214 articles that are in the legal category, and these are high risk news. So you might say, let me read that first, because that's the supplier I'm most concerned with, and I'm really worried when there's a high risk article floated up to me. And I might look at it here and say, I look at the title, what's the source, um, brief description of what type of news you might be reading, the language source when it was loaded, and then the variations that we use. But all of these, have legal as your hustle angle and high risk news. There are some that have multiple, so some that means that there is multiple hustle angles tied to it, and there's medium and low risk particles as well. So I might take one of these and say this is my um, licensed source, and I might look at the, the news itself, read, and it will kind of highlight as I go where, wherever I need to keep my eyes focused, right? And once I read the news and it feels like, yes, this is supposed to, this, this impacts my supply chain, I look at why is it here, and it's around the business torts, so you have high risk. Uh, for legal, you also have some litigation, which is a medium risk, and suits and claim, which is a low risk article. So that way you, you see within your view, so you land from a very high level bird's eye view of where is your risk living. Then you look at, is my supplier, the one of my uh, top supplier in that top 10, that means it's producing the most amount of negative high-risk news, and then you go down all the way to the document level, and you read to find out what is happening and if it's going to make an impact on you or not, and if it does, you know, then you can have your plan of action. But this tells you here around what, what entities mentioned, um, that way you're kind of uh, tied, you're anchored, it is still your entity. You know, you're reading this because it has something to do with the, your supplier that you're monitoring, and there is some risk here, uh, a little bit of information about the source and, you know, your total number of words and all that. This will be helpful if you, because we harvest both licensed and web content. When you're reading a web content, you're going to get only a brief description like here, and knowing that this article is pretty lengthy, it's about 8,756 words, and it also has high-risk news around class actions, um, you can go and read the full article at the actual source. So this will launch you to the, the source where we harvest the gifts from, and you can read the full article there. And again, you just go back to your um, here, and you can keep navigating next, 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 and read all of them, or you can say, now let me move on to a, uh, another one, um, Apple. Or you could just say, uh, never mind, I need to go back and now look at the trending terms, because if you are um, uh, particularly sensitive to a certain area of risk, um, not always entity driven, but maybe topical. But you might look at our um, Tesla index terms and say, so, you know, whenever I see price increase, pollution, uh, or financial grading downgrades, I am concerned. So if you see one of those terms float up to the top, it's just again driven very much by volume, but it has banking and finance regulations, has 5,836 articles, and weather related is around 882. Right? And then if you are looking at your political angle, there's, you know, 1,097. So whatever is your interest, whatever is um, going to have more impact on you, uh, you can drill down to see what type of articles are coming up here and what type of entities fall under these um, puzzle categories. Right? So air uh, gas yeah, seems to be floating up pretty high, even within my entities, and I also see that it is also floating up high in my index terms, so I might want to do a little bit more deep dive on air gas and find out what is happening. Okay? Uh, but um, overall, the product is, is, uh, has the same usability, so uh, the way you access and navigate through articles and move deeper and deeper, and then bring you back to your bird size view again. It's easy, so same maneuvering, same usability, same user experience throughout the product. And once I know all of these, how do I get to this? stage, right? How do I get to this 376 entities being monitored, and then it's telling me that two need some kind of action. So I will walk you through that step now, 
And so you can go through your upload. So when you are a brand new user, you're going to be uh, taken to this page, which is a guided walkthrough that we provide you with the template. You simply download a template. It's an Excel version of it. And just for this and demonstration purpose, I've already downloaded that and kind of pulled, you know, entered the dummy number here. But you see the type of fields that we are collecting um, and some helpful tips to say what, what do we expect here, right? So dumps number is enough to understand. Uh, why, is, um, is, why is it important to have variations of the entity name? Uh, we give you a little bit of a toolkit. Um, and you look at your category, which category does this uh, entity fall under. You look at your include keywords. And you also want, might want to exclude keywords. So in this example, I'm just putting our parent company, um, Relics. And there's readers here. I have another variation. And I might want to know news whenever there is LexisNexis, BIS, or the risk mentioned. But not always when there's execution business. That's another one of our business mentioned. Always exclude. What this does is you might do business with a supplier, but you don't buy all of the goods and services from that supplier. So you could limit the things that you don't buy. Um, and then one of the examples I give is you know, if you are doing business with Dell and it's your supplier, you only buy computers from them, from them but you don't um, use them for the servers. In that case, you could just say exclude anything that has servers tied to Dell. That way you don't get news that is tied to servers, but you do get news that is tied to the computers. So it's the same idea here. And we also collect the entity URL. That way um, I will show you how it's used within the product. But it's just to make sure that when there are similarly named companies, uh, you want to make sure that there is some URL and distinction there. And I go back to my page. It's simple. And so you put all of your data there. And there is no limitation on how many you can upload. The only limitation is your subscription tab. So in my this environment, I have up to 10,000. So I can upload up to 10,000 entities at a time. Or I can upload one at a time, 10, whatever you need to upload until you max out your subscription. You select a file from your computer, you open through this, and then you go to your review stage. And just for uh, to speed up the process today, let's say I uploaded the file, and this is what I will see. Uh, it is kind of a confirmation of the data that you put in your Excel has been transferred to the product. And you, you also have a chance to edit and make changes at this at any time. This is just to speed up and bring the data to the product. And I can do one, or I can do multiple. So just for the example, I will go and say, now that I have Samsung and read Elsevier as my two entities I've added, I want to see this preview or the preview all function available here. Um, this, is, this will kind of give me an idea of what type of news would be produced if I bring in the keyword inclusion, exclusion, your entity name variance, all of that in play, what will happen. So I'm looking at it, and I'm, this is giving me kind of a last 30 day snapshot of what type of news was produced uh, for Samsung based on my criteria. And I can also say, well, let me see if I can change this. There's only eight to six results. Maybe I'm expecting more. So I might just say, well, Galaxy 1 is no longer relevant. Galaxy 2 no longer relevant. So I might just say, let's remove those keywords. And you should see the results change in real time. So based on your tweaks, and again, it's not just inclusion. It's also exclusion. You could make the same, right? So here there's a lot of um, you know, the junk data added just for the, the demo. And once I remove it, does it increase my image results, right? I might just say, let me remove all the exclusion. And any time Galaxy is mentioned and there is Samsung in play, please show me the results. And once I feel comfortable with the results, I might say, yes, this looks good, right? You still get your pestle anchoring here with your uh, the language source. And is it in legal? And is it high risk? Or I might just say, what type of news does it bring when I select technological? And it will do the filtering for you. That way you know, um, you know when a supplier is within a certain uh, personal angle, what type of risk it's producing, mostly high-risk articles based on our knowledge of the Galaxy. Um, then you can also go and say, is there any legal say there? And then it will refresh the results. That way it's just giving you one more chance to fix all of the keywords before you activate. This is an ongoing process. It's a real-time product, so you are not um, tied to this change. This is only for the moment. And next day, or for later on, if you want to add or tweak any of the keywords, you can always come back and edit. And the results will be um, in a real-time, so from anything that's been produced for the future will reflect the changes that you made. And I might feel comfortable with this, so I can just say, please activate and show next entity. 
or you can just go to the next entity and say, let me see what happens. So I'll go ahead and activate Samson just for this um, demo. And then now I, when I go back to my home page, I should see that instead of two of them needing my attention, there will be only one needing my attention because I already took care of one of the entities that was there. And if for some reason, if uh, Samson was producing a lot of news, more than Airgas or, or Walmart or IBM, Donald Trump, it would be put it up on the top. So our algorithm in the back end looks at how many uh, news was produced within the time frame that I selected for my supplier. Okay, so the results will be refreshed in the dashboard right away. Um, now I have all of these, uh, the upload and bringing it to the system. I will walk you through a little bit of the entity management. So you have 337 entities, 377 entities that you need to manage. Sometimes you terminate your relationship with the current supplier, sometimes you can add more, sometimes you buy additional goods and services, sometimes you don't. So just to make changes, you can go ahead and say, let me look at all of the entities that's here, and I want to just find one, even though I see uh, Samsung in my screen. Uh, you could do this for any of the entities that are further down in the page. Anytime I have Samsung mentioned, to show, show the results. Now I have four, and I can go and say, let me edit this. And now I go back to the same uh, entity that I uploaded earlier, and this is the way to make change. The changes you can make in an entity here, it's not limited to your keyword and the inclusion exclusion that I showed you before, but also anything tied to the entity, right? You could refine this further and just say, Samsung, but only North America. Right? Or you could also say, well, my entity ID, so you, some of you guys um, switch your uh, SRM or your uh, ERP system sometimes and then assign new IDs to them. You can update that. You can always input the dance number tied to this um, entity or the Experian ID. And this is the web address, and I, I did not uh, enter the web address at the time of upload, so I want to just make sure that it's captured. Okay. And then that, that will be now part of the record. And I can also always inactivate. What inactivate does for you is it stops producing news for that moment. It is not gone, so it is still the data that you have within the system, but it will make sure that from this point on, when I say inactive, there will be no news produced for Samsung because I no longer want to monitor that. You could do, you could do that for various reasons. One is when you know, the, the Samsung phone started blowing up in the plane, all of a sudden all the news wire was going crazy, harvesting thousands and thousands of news. And you already know the event happened, so just for that day, if you want to tone down the news, you might just say inactivate. And then when that uh, dies down a little, you can go and activate again. And if you could do the same thing when a natural disaster strikes in a certain uh, area where your supplier lives. Or you could also say inactivate because maybe you, you are in your performance improvement plan with the supplier and you're kind of waiting to see if they um, meet your expectations uh, in your relationship, and then you can again start monitoring them. So whatever your reason is, it just inactivate will stop the news from being produced. It doesn't go and erase the history, so you will still get the historical news tied to that, but you don't get anything in the future until you activate. And then, again, here, anytime you want to make changes to your entity, the name, variance, keyword, inclusion, exclusion is always available for you. And one thing I wanted to point out here is you start seeing multiple languages. So it is a global product, so you start seeing languages um, today. It's in English, it's a U.S. and U.K. English, and you have German and French. So if there are any other articles that is being produced in French, you would see that floated on top. And we still maintain our puzzle scoring. I will spend a little bit of time here around your entities mentioned. This is your variations of entities that you want to monitor, your risk angle, and then your fines and penalties. That's the index term. And it's telling me this today because my, my interface language is English, even though the article itself is in German. And we have uh, something in the works. In the next few weeks, we will start seeing your interface language of German and French. And what this will do is translate the index term itself in my interface language. If I'm a French speaker, everything, my labels will be changed to French, and my index term will be changed and translated to French. That way I know what it's referring to within the legal angle, and what is the index term, and then a French article. If it is a German article, we still maintain the source, so your, all of your details here will be French because that's the language you choose to do the product in but the language itself, will, the, the source itself will be in German. 
Okay, so that is um, just in the language, and then we go back to managing the, the entities, and this is around editing. You can always go back, and sometimes if you no longer do business with the um, entity, you could choose to delete them, and that will, it will free up your, some of your subscription plan coda. You can also go ahead and do multi-select, right? You can select all. You can also see all of these suppliers that I have selected. They actually belong in a different category, so I could just say and put them all within automotive or banking. And these are the categories that I brought into the system by uploading. You can also go ahead and add a category into the individual entity itself. So I could say there's none of the category has been assigned here, so let me add um, a category. So I'm not going to mess up this data here, but you could do that uh, on an entity level as well. I will briefly move on to the feeds now, and this is, again, this is how you, this is our consuming, so this is how do you consume so much of the news being produced. So one is the dashboard, you narrow down based on your angles, which angle do you want to focus on, or maybe you have time to go through each of them and scan for the high risk news only, or a specific puzzle angle. Or you could also say, well, I will integrate this feed somewhere, somewhere else. Right? So you can go, and I have a feed here called my test feed. And what I have done here is I have chosen to receive all the active entities, everything I've activated, and all the personal angles. And I can also say what type of news does that produce, right? That means everything, everything, full on. And I get a snapshot of the most recent 100 articles to say, well, these are the type of news and these are the type of companies that will be mentioned, and these are the sources that you will get. And once, if I feel comfortable with that, I can say, well, I will just take the speed. I can also refresh to see the most recent one that comes up. So it's, um, again, within a few seconds, we, by the time we harvest, it actually gets to your system. And I can also say, well, that's too much, and I'm monitoring way too much, and I might be a category manager. I am only interested in a specific set of entities, and I can always go and edit that. So what I've done here by default is you all, all, but I can say, no, let me just monitor a specific category, right? So you can say, I'm only interested in banking, or you could just say, uh, let's do IT, um, and I can say IT only, and I also want to monitor only a specific set of puzzle angle, not all. And I can say, I only want to know when it's hyper-political, but high and medium for economics. I always want to know all social, all technological. I don't want to know anything legal, and I don't want to know anything environmental. So this could be my selection for this particular category. And I can always make the changes, right? It's not you're not um, stuck to the, your initial selection. And once I say only one category, it will save. But I can also say I only want one feed for one supplier, right? Maybe you are in the middle of negotiation, a new contract, you want, you want to actively monitor this particular um, entity, you could go and select one from our list. All of the 377 is available for you. Or you could also say, I want to only monitor one. And it will produce um, your search result. You find the supplier you want to monitor. And you, you say, this is the one I want. And you go ahead and save. And once you make the change, your URL will, will stay the same, but your news will now reflect the changes that you made. Okay, and then there is again no limitations on how many feeds you can set up. You can set up as many as you need, and you can do all of this configuration based on the categories, the puzzle angle, and easy thing to do is just create the URL here, copy, and then you can paste it wherever you need to put your RSS. If you have RSS feed reader, if you have your you want to get it delivered in your inbox, put it in your Outlook, it's just a matter of putting it in your Reader. And just for example, I have one here. It's just a free available browser plugin, right? It just looks at all the news that's been produced and you see them. Or you can just say, well, I, I can't read all of those thousands of articles being um, produced, but I do want to know the most recent ones that were produced. And then you just read it in app. And with that, I will go back to my dashboard. And I want to be conscious of time here. But all of the changes that I've made, so I went through the management of entities page and then management of the, the RSS feed itself, any change that, uh, that has happened within the last 10 or 15 minutes that I, I was away from the dashboard will be reflected here. So if there were new set of articles being produced within that last 10 minutes, it will show up in your dashboard. You can easily hover and see the changes. 
was 139. So, and, and this morning when I logged in, it was around 135. So you see a change is here. And again, if anything, um, so let's say something big recall was happening within the Walmart and, and a lot of news was being produced that was high risk, it would have jumped up on the top. Again, very much volume driven, kind of giving you um, the coverage and reputational damage that there might be based on the coverage alone. Uh, all of that information will be produced here. Okay, with that, um, I would like to go back to our, um, our poll question. And Oriana, if you can take over. Thank you, Pavana. Before we move on to the Q&A session, with, we would like to ask you if you'd like to receive a free copy of our white paper, The Risk Monitoring Imperative. So if you could please answer the poll question that just popped up on your screen. Um, simply answer yes or no. Okay, so let's move on to um, some questions. There are a couple people that have requested a copy of the presentation, and we will, of course, be sending all of those out to you shortly. Um, and then, Savannah, could you touch on a little bit on the benefits of integration um, and what type of system uh, entity insight could be integrated with? Sure. So the, the way it's designed, right, it's meant to be an ongoing monitoring of risk for your suppliers, right? So the easiest place you could put this would be to say wherever you are getting your, your email, you could say, well, just let me know when something pops up that's high risk or for a certain um, entity. And that's the, the configuration that I showed you earlier in the product where you could narrow down your news results based on a set of entities or a set of categories. Other way to do it is if you use our feed reader, you can go put it there. The most most common place we see this is within your supplier management system or within your ERP system. Wherever you house your supplier data, that's the best place to integrate the RSS feed. That way you have your supplier management tools in place, all of the data that you collect during the onboarding and your contract and your performance management, everything that you house for your supplier is in the same place where you are seeing the risk for that supplier. That way you have more context on who is the supplier, what type of news is it producing, and is this something that I need to have a conversation about with the supplier. Okay, thank you so much. And then what industries are most vulnerable to regulatory enforcement? I think this is a question for Karen. Yeah, Uliana, on that. yeah sure, I'll, I'll take that. Um, the most vulnerable to regulatory enforcement, at least as far as I can, can tell, um, I've really studied that through Trace International. And of course, they usher up engineering and construction, um, almost a no-brainer. Um, anything in the extractive market, um, oil and gas, manufacturing services. The one that really surprises me, perhaps, it's on the rise, is transportation and communication. And I would say that um, the Trace International report did not cover retail. But we've seen a lot in the retail space as well, where you've got um, enforcement being um, uh, levied against institutions that have uh, modern slavery as part of their general makeup. So I would say that the reliance upon that GER report that we mentioned earlier in the presentation, engineering, construction, manufacturing, uh, transportation, communications, and I would suspect retail is not far behind. Thank you. And what would you say is the biggest challenge in the compliance landscape as it relates to monitoring those third parties? I think the biggest challenge we've seen, at least in our space, um, we've been with LexisNexis for a while, um, but there is a deeper engagement of boards and senior management, um, unlike before. If you're talking a traditional supply chain motion, um, it was really about ROI and revenue streams and um, negotiating prices and watching commodities and so forth. And so, you know, now that you have such um, social media campaigns, and again, as we mentioned earlier, this, you know, 24-hour-a-day news that's nearly ongoing, that, that board and that senior management be, that board and that senior management could be, you know, really on top of something that is either news breaking abroad. Um, you know, they understand the risks of reputational damage. It's obvious about um, the, the social media pr footprint that they all have. Um, they want to stay ahead of the of the compliance process naturally. Um, if they don't, they should. I would just put that editorial comment there. Um, and I would also say that in a compliance perspective, um, 
almost leading back to the earlier question, you know, there are enforcement resources that are really honing in on some industries. Some geographies are better known to have corruption motions going on than others, perhaps. But I would say that the, the culture of which our global landscape represents, that those resources are being dedicated where the, the hottest investigations, uh, the greatest impact of social justice could be, could be alleviated. And I'd, I don't know, I'd probably add that relying, again, we've said this before um, in previous seminars, that we have uh, really gotten away from just relying solely on the financial footprint of a third party. I think that's antiquated. That's my thoughts. That's thoughts of the customers that we service, that there are so many variables out there that are past the footprint of the financial stability, a traditional credit report, a traditional you know, um, 10K, 10Q, you know, Edgar filings from your publicly traded companies. The, the challenge is that in, that in that landscape, we're so often looking at small companies, privately held institutions, and those don't escape things like sanctions or PEPLIS or you know, OFAC or any sort of public records that might be available to us here in the U.S. So, you know, each one of those is a, a point of entry for a company's reputation, and certainly you know, at the front of the the presentation here where we see that, you know, tens of thousands or, you know, tens of hundreds of third parties that you may be doing business with, your your potential risk is certainly increased or could be increased. Thank you so much. And then is there a limit to the number of entities that can be entered through LexisNexis Entity Insight? Donna? No, there is Sorry, I was just trying to share my screen again. I went to the, the blog. Can you repeat that again, Ojana? Yeah, I see it. Okay. Um, Sorry. Is there a limit to the number of entities that can be entered through Lexis, Nexus Entity Insight? No, there is no limitation on, on how many you can monitor at a time. The only limitation is around how many you decide to purchase. So in the example, in my demo environment, I had about 10,000 available in my subscription plan. But if you had bought only 500, that's how many you can monitor. But as a product, we don't put any limitation on how many you can monitor. So you can monitor up to 40,000, 50,000, if that's what you choose to do. So, Liana, maybe just to tack on uh, Pawana's answer here in that number, you know, several of you may be considering either criticality or spend or you have some sort of tiering process in place. Um, we have consultants on our end that help work with our individual, you know, customers that are trying to put processes in place. Maybe they're maturing. Maybe they, you know, are less mature than others. So, you know, we often find that those are tiered either by, again, thin, criticality, single source uh, providers, things of that nature. I would say that for uh, bulk upload, as, as uh, Pawana demonstrated earlier in this nice, small Excel spreadsheet, um, it is really a turnkey tool that an individual would be able to add and delete suppliers or third parties as those business relationships change. Um, we had some surveys out to some of our customers that said, hey, this needs to be a bit more turnkey. And so part of our next generation tool was to allow an end user or some sort of administrator on the end of our uh, consumer of the, of, of the data um, to be able to change at will as Pawana was doing today. Awesome, thank you. And then also, if a company focuses on mergers and acquisitions, for example, would it be possible to use LexisNexis Entity Insight to get updates on companies that they're targeting or that reside in their portfolio? I would say absolutely. I mean, if you've got an M&A department, you've probably got a dotted line to either legal or compliance or whatnot in your organization. Um, it goes without saying that if you were sharing the same dashboard and you had third parties that fell in more of a supply chain category and you wanted to use the same dashboard, if you will, for um, those entities that you were targeting or wanted to monitor through that process, whether that process is onboarding or acquisition, the same motion of, of tracking you know, negative implications and risk events certainly could, could extend to M&A activity, sure. Awesome. And would the same go for the competitors, too? Uh, to many monitor competitors through the tool? I, I, I don't see why not. I think, um, 
especially if you're in a regulated industry, if you're in a bank or if you're in you know, oil and gas or any of the other um, regulated industries that are out there, if you see that something is happening to perhaps one of your competitors, um, almost in the don't let this happen to us scenario, uh, we certainly would want to keep track of things that are changing the landscape of how we as an either an, uh, an industry that is uh, regulated or even in monitoring our third parties that are regulated, I think that monitoring competitors wouldn't, wouldn't be a far reach. Awesome. I don't see any other questions on my end unless there were some that were sent to um, our speakers directly. Uliana, there was one question that came in from one of the participants about CLE credit for the course today. Um, we would need to know, I, I can answer that um, at least briefly, uh, we would need to know what state you're in. Um, various states have different stipulations on how we can honor um, continuing education credit. Some of those have to be done in person. Some can be done over the phone in a webinar seminar like we've done today. So um, that candidate, if you will, um, um, if you want to provide your state for us, we'd be happy to research that for you. And I think it's a simple matter of us providing the content, the agenda, the um, the goal of the session in order to uh, to facilitate that continuing education credit. We'd be happy to run that down for you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Karen and Pavana. And on behalf of Lexus X, thank you for your time and participation on today's call. Um, you will receive an email within one to two business days that will alert you to the on-demand status of today's event, including the copy of the presentation. And for more thought leadership information on risk monitoring or due diligence, please follow us on Twitter or subscribe to our blog at LexisNexus.com slash bizblog. Thank you so much. And as you drop off, there is a post-survey question in Aaron that we'd like for you to answer, if you don't mind. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.